Have you ever been anywhere, done something, experienced something, and not wanted that moment, that place, that experience, whatever it might be, to end? Have you ever been in those situations where you've not wanted something, whatever it might be, to end? At least one person has, that's good. <coughs> the rest of you look at me like, huh? <laughs> She's not encouraging, but never mind. <laughs> um, I, I, there was one other person, you? anyone else? Have you ever had, yes, you've had those sort of experiences. People feel like it often, don't they? Maybe going on a holiday somewhere, you think, fantastic, this is a great place, I don't want this to end. Or uh, some other experience you're having with someone, you don't want to end. Uh, one that remi- I'm reminded of uh, every now and again is, is the idea of children not wanting to grow up or parents not wanting their children to grow up. Uh, babies, perhaps, they, don't, they like that, that moment of the baby and they don't want the child to grow up. And yet, at the same time with these experiences and these things, if they stay as they are, there's something lost. If we stay on that holiday forever, it soon begins to pale, it soon loses its specialness, it soon fades doesn't have the same luster to it and if the baby or the child doesn't grow up then all that experience of life blossoming and coming to fruition and all the future that there is is lost as well there's something exciting in the moving on there's that opportunity to grow and to develop there are all sorts of things that can be laid out before us we can't just stay where we are and our reading that we're going to focus on later on is of the transfiguration that incredible and bizarre in many ways moment when Jesus is on the mountaintop with his disciples and is transfigured before them and they speak of wanting to stay there with him and in some ways that's understandable because it was such a tremendous and wonderful moment And yet, staying there wasn't the right thing. There was more to do. There was work to carry out. There was God's love to share. They needed to come back down from that mountaintop. They needed to continue with their lives and be blessed by God as they did so, as they grew in faith, as they developed, and as they became those who shared his story with us. There is importance in those moments they are exciting they are thrilling but we cannot hold on to them we have to let them pass and move on to the work that God calls us to do our first lesson is from Matthew chapter 17 verses 1 to 9 six days later Jesus took Peter James and his brother John to the top of a high and lonely hill. And as they watched, his appearance changed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothing became dazzling white. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and were talking with him. Peter blurted out, Sir, it's wonderful that we can be here. If you want me to, I'll make three shelters, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. But even as he said it, a bright cloud came over them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, and I am wonderfully pleased with him. Obey him. At this, the disciples fell face forward to the ground, terribly frightened. Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked, only Jesus was with them. As they were going down the mountain, Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone what they had seen until after he had risen from the dead. Thanks be to God. The second reading is taken from the second book of Peter, chapter 1, verses 16 to 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honour and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son, who am I love, 
With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable, and you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning stars rise in our hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Amen. At this point in Matthew's Gospel, where we had uh, our reading taken from, there are a, a lot of startling things occurring. In the chapter prior to our reading, we have Peter's great confession of who Jesus is, followed by Jesus informing the disciples of his coming death, and then Peter suddenly being called Satan because he can't cope with what Jesus is saying. That change from where Peter was <coughs> declaring who Jesus was to then suddenly being spoken of very harshly by Jesus. And then after all that, here we have the transfiguration, arguably one of the most remarkable events in Jesus' time on earth. Jesus heads off up a mountain. The mountain being a, a common place for things to happen within Scripture. Whenever someone goes up a mountain, you know that something is about to happen. It's not just a, a, a casual trip somewhere, but something is going to occur. It's a, a place where there is often an epiphany, some sort of revelation of God or an understanding for people, or what's uh, theologically called a theophany, where there is a, literally a, a revelation of God. That happens very often on mountaintops. We see it throughout Scripture happening again and again as people go to mountaintops and meet with God. And here Jesus goes up the mountain and takes his inner, what we could call his inner circle with him. Peter, James and John, these three characters who seem to be very key to what goes on. Note that... These three who are the select of the chosen, really. They're, they're also those ones who are invited to pray with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before his arrest. These three are key figures and very important to Jesus, it seems. And so the four of them go up the mountain. Why do they go up the mountain? What is the reason for them going up the mountain? Well, Luke tells us in his Gospel that it was in order to go and pray. But the other gospel accounts don't tell us that. They don't give a reason for why they go up the mountain, just that Jesus told them to go and they went. Perhaps it was for prayer. Perhaps it was for some sort of special teaching. Perhaps it was to gain specific experience. Maybe it was simply so they could encounter God in the way that happened. We don't specifically know why they went. But while they are there, Peter, James and John witness Jesus being transfigured before them. He is changed. He is still recognisably him, but he is changed. And God's glory shines out of him. His full glory is seen there on the mountaintop. That uh, glory that has been masked in some way up to that point is suddenly shown. And Jesus is seen for who he truly is. Following on, from Peter's declaration that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now we have his glory shone, shining out on the mountaintop. In that moment of transfiguration, his glory is revealed. And no longer can these three disciples have any doubt over who Jesus is. And note Peter's reflection on the event in that reading from his second letter that we heard. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, he says. We ourselves heard when we were with him on the holy mountain. This, this moment there on the top of the mountain is one of those occasions where when the heavenly realm breaks into our world and in, into our consciousness. Not that the heavenly realm isn't there normally, but there are these moments and times and places where the heavenly realm breaks in to our world. 
These sort of events happen at, at locations that people often describe as thin places. That is, places where we can have a better understanding and even glimpse a glimpse of those things that are, that are usually beyond our ken, usually beyond our understanding, that, that often an, an understanding of, oh, let's go back a step, traditionally an understanding of heaven was that, that we had the earth, uh, in, in biblical times, we had the earth and we had the firmament above where the waters were held above by the firmament and above that was heaven, which is why we often talk about looking up to heaven and so on and so forth, even, even today, even, even though we know that heaven isn't strictly up there, Often today, people talk about the idea of heaven being all around us. But we just don't fully understand it's there. We can't yet perceive it. But there are those moments, those places, those times where we come to thin places and we feel something more of heaven being there that we can almost touch. And we get a greater understanding of of heaven and God's kingdom and, and, and God himself. You may have been in places and moments like that in your lives where you've had that greater feeling of God around you and with you. Here on the mountaintop, something of that is happening in the transfiguration. For Peter and James and John, this was a, this was a moment when the veil was lifted. Or to think in Pauline terms, in, in how he writes in his letters, where we normally see in a glass darkly, they were blessed to be able to truly see face to face. That idea of, for us, something is cloudy, we can't quite see. But in that moment, for them, they could truly see. I had a, a, an understanding of quite what it means to see through a glass darkly recently. I was having a conversation with my father when we were last with them. I can't remember if it was up there or down here now, but we, we were with them. And, and, and he was talking about the fact he had recently had a cataract, relatively recently had a cataract operation. Some of you may have gone through the same thing yourselves. And he talked about suddenly how having had his cataract observa- uh, operation, um, he, he could see colours vividly. I, I, I couldn't get over the fact that beforehand when we were... As you know, I like playing games. We were playing games. He couldn't work out what colour was what in the games, which was something he'd been able to do beforehand. He couldn't see properly the colours because of his cataracts. And suddenly, after his operation, everything was bright and vivid and clear. Almost an illustration for us of that looking through a glass darkly for us. We can't see things properly. It's not clear. It's not necessarily definable. And suddenly, one day... We will be able to see face to face. We will be able to see things clearly as they truly are. And here on the mountaintop, Peter, James and John get that experience. They see things as they truly are. They see Jesus as he truly is. They have this glimpse of truth. And as Jesus is transfigured, Moses and Elijah appear beside him and are seen to talk with him. Moses is the lawgiver, represents the old covenant. Of course, Jesus is coming to bring the new covenant. And Elijah represents the prophets, those who heralded God. Elijah is seen as the greatest of the prophets. Elijah is held in great esteem even today at the Passover. The the Jews will leave a chair at the table for Elijah, who is thought to be coming back one day. There is always a chair left for Elijah so that he can come and join. Elijah is held in great esteem as the greatest of the prophets. They together, Moses and Elijah, represent the epitome of great figures from Israel's past. Of course, the question that always comes to mind as we read this is, how are they (laughs) recognised? We don't know how they're recognised, but somehow people know that. I don't don't suppose they wore name badges. I I don't assume that Moses had his tablets of stone in his arm and Elijah his his leather belt and and, and garment of camel's hair. We don't know exactly how they were recognised, but it was known that this was Elijah and Moses meeting with Jesus on the mountaintop. And their presence is an indication of Jesus' greatness. And Peter now speaks of building three shelters for them and in that he as he does so he indicates that he doesn't yet fully comprehend who Jesus is he he regards these three as equals and of course they're not and the three shelters themselves can be viewed in two ways really are they being offered as dwellings for the three of them to, to to live in 
to take a bode in, or are they being seen as memorials, that we could put them here as memorials to what happened in this place? And then it's at that moment that God's voice is then heard to speak from a cloud that comes over them. Again, we've had this moment going up the mountain, as I've said, is is, is important because things always happen on the mountain and the cloud is often used as a representation of God. This is a, a, a typical way that God reveals himself to people. We think of the cloud with being a presence with the Israelites during the Exodus as they travel through the wilderness. The cloud goes before them. God's presence is there with them and goes and dwells in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle when they, when they encamp. Think of the presence on the mountaintop in other cases. When Moses goes up the mountaintop, up Sinai to get the commandments and other times God comes and meets with him in a cloud, envelops him in the cloud. Think of his presence in the temple as well. This idea of the cloud bringing God's presence, being a symbol for God's presence. Here, the voice comes from the cloud, speaking words that are reminiscent to that moment of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan by John. But here, there's something added to those words. We hear the reiteration of, this is my beloved son. Then the disciples are told, listen to him. And the disciples fall face down on the ground, a common reaction to being confronted by or with God. And Jesus says to them, do not be afraid. He encourages them. He he touches them. And they still see that he's still the same Jesus, despite what they have seen. It is their attitudes that must now change. There's a question for us. Do we see Jesus for who he really is? The disciples were forced to do so on the Mount of Transfiguration. There was nothing else they could do when Jesus was transfigured before them. There was nothing else they could do but see him for who he really is. That event changed them. Their ideas and their preconceptions were altered, shaken even at that time. They didn't turn away though, but went out in proclamation in due course. How do we see Jesus? Do we see Jesus as the Son of God? Do we see him as our Saviour? Do we see him as the way, the truth and the life? Or do we simply see him to be like any other person? To be just a good man? Jesus is different. We need to acknowledge that fact. We need to recognise him for who he is. And a further question, building on what we spoke, I spoke about earlier. Are we trying to remain? The disciples wanted to remain. It was a a place of wonder, a place of safety, a place of joy. But Jesus made them come down off the mountain. His glory was hidden again, though its memory stayed in their hearts, of course. The event on the mountaintop, the time on the mountaintop was good. But they had to move on. Do we try to hang on to our past glories? Are we more comfortable remaining when we should be moving on to a new place, whatever that might be, however that may be discerned? God reveals himself to us just as he revealed himself to his disciples and we may be blessed with wondrous moments. But they are just that, moments. Not timeless, but fleeting. They inspire and they excite, but they are also meant to encourage us to move on. The American Presbyterian pastor with one of those great American names, Joseph Harvard III, makes this comment comment when he says this. He says, we all need mountaintop experiences. These are sacred moments when God's presence comes near to assure us or to challenge us. 
two hymns or parts of hymns sum this all up for us, I think. In the hymn that we sang, sang a short while ago, Joseph Robinson wrote, How good, Lord, to be here. Your glory fills the night. Your face and garments like the sun shine with unborrowed light. How good, Lord, to be here. Yet we may not remain. But since you bid us leave the mount, come with us to the plain. And Samuel Gregg wrote this in one of his hymns. Stay, master, stay upon this heavenly hill. A little longer, let us linger still. No, saith the Lord, the hour is past, we go. Our home, our life, our duties lie below. While here we kneel upon the mount of prayer, the plough lies waiting in the furrow there. Here we sought God, that we might know his will. There we must do it, serve him, seek him still. These hymns teach us a truth. That while it's good to be on the mount, and we should celebrate those moments when we are, we must remember that we cannot remain there. We must remember we have a duty to do. We must remember that this duty is to carry out God's work in the world. Yet we do not do it alone. My time's up. We are empowered and accompanied by the very same God whose glory is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. As Joseph Harvard III also says, God gives us mountaintop experiences that are transformative. They change the way we see the world and ourselves. Business as usual is no longer possible after you have seen the vision of God's good future revealed to us in Jesus Christ. And he continues, when your eyes are open to God's good future, then you cannot go back. However, You can go back down the path to be a healing presence to those who are hurting, to work for justice and peace, and to offer hope. This is what we are called to do. This is what our mountaintop experiences do for us. This is how God encourages us. May we rejoice in our mountaintop experiences when they come to us. And may we seek to use them to bless others and to bring them to know God's love for themselves. Amen.